Hey, welcome to Sci-Fi Secrets. So it's finally time for this channel to live up to its name. Well, kind of anyways, this book is debatably one of the softer sci-fi I will do on this channel. But it is definitely lesser known, much more of a secret. This video is about an out-of-print book called Of Men and Monsters by, well, it says on the cover anyway, William Ten. Let me read you this note in the back of my copy. William Ten is the pen name of London-born Philip Class. He began writing in 1945 after being discharged from the army, and his first story was published a year later. His stories and articles have been widely anthologized, a number of them in Best of the Year collections. Currently, he is a professor of English at the Pennsylvania State University, where he teaches, among other things, a popular science fiction course. And no, it's not that Philip Class. This guy has nothing to do with UFOs. Other than maybe the ones in the story he wrote, I guess? Okay, I'm not selling this very good, am I? Well, just take my word for it. It's a different guy. Here's some pics to prove it. So now let's talk about the themes of the book before I give a spoilers warning, and then we will get into the meat of the story. Of Men and Monsters was a very controversial book for many reasons when it was released, and probably still would be today, especially in the current political climate. But if you can have a sense of humor about it, this is a very funny book in my opinion, or at least the punchline at the end is. The rest of it's pretty well written, though the characters are not well fleshed out, it's still engaging, dramatic, and a bit cliche at points, but it's meant to be. It tries to lull you into a sense that you know the rest of the story already. He wants you to think you know how it's going to play out, and are just reading to see the specific details of how it's accomplished. Philip Class was a teacher of sci-fi at Philly U, after all. Some people feel a bit cheated by the ending, because it does not seem to fulfill on its perceived promise. I know the first time I read it, I could feel that there were only a few pages left in the book, and I couldn't figure out how they would do it in that short of a time. Then I read the ending and I was a bit baffled. Was that a win? I wasn't sure. Kind of felt like it wasn't. I thought on it for a while, and the more I did, the more I liked the ending. On the second reading, when I knew it was coming, it was downright funny to me. I was literally laughing out loud as I read the final chapter. The ending is controversial for several reasons. Not only did people feel cheated by the ending, they felt insulted by what it implied about humanity. But let's stop talking about the ending, since it's what makes the book so amazing in my opinion. It's the whole reason to read the book. Another controversial theme of the story is the evolution of humans. In this book, humans have adapted to new environments that they have been forced into. You may be unaware, but there is actually a large group of mostly religious people in America that do not believe in evolution. Although, this may fall under what they call microevolution, so maybe they won't be too bothered by a book like this. I wouldn't know personally. The setting for the book is in the future, after a race of absolutely gigantic aliens have taken over the Earth. Let me read you what it says on the front cover. Mankind consists of 128 people hardly noticed by the super-aliens that had taken over Earth. Eric the Only is a young man, about to take his initiation test for manhood. He must sneak into the monster's territory and steal something and bring it back to show his courage. The last adolescent to try this was caught and killed by the gigantic aliens, smashed against a wall like a bug. Will Eric be next? Okay, I've honestly said about all I can say without giving away parts of the book. But before you turn off the video, think about this. There are only about 20 copies of the book available on Amazon. I don't know where else you would look to find it. It's out of print. So just the people that watch this video could completely buy out all available copies of the book, and there would still be many of you watching this that couldn't get one if you tried at that point. So unless you can get your hands on a copy, or at least plan to, the spoilers don't really matter now, do they? But it's up to you. So like I said, it's spoilers time now. You have been warned. Let me go over the story before I talk about it. So as I said, Eric is sent out on his steal. His trip to monster territory to steal something for all mankind. All 128 of them. They are very tribalistic. They have been living in the burrows for many generations and have adapted to life there. They have even evolved a bit so that most pregnancies are multiple kids. Six in a quote-unquote litter was not unheard of. Usually all non-identical twins, by the way. But Eric was Eric the Only. He was born without any twins. He was a singleton. But worse than that, he didn't even have any brothers or sisters. 
He was an only, Eric the only, which made his manhood questionable. What woman would want a man who might only give her one kid her entire life? Well, there was one woman. She had red hair, so no man wanted her either. Red hair is unlucky, after all. She seemed interested, but those thoughts had to wait. First, he must become a man before he is allowed to take a mate, something the other men in his band make sure to remind him when they see him looking at her. Before Eric even leaves the burrows to make his theft, his world starts to radically change, however. His uncle and band leader, Thomas the Trap Smasher, tells him that at his ceremony before the theft, he must declare a Category 3 theft. You see, the initiate must tell the tribe what he plans to steal before he steals it to prove his worth. Category 1 was food. Easy. Category 2 was anything useful to mankind. But Category 3 was monster technology. So Eric declares that he will get monster tech, which ruins his ceremony as the chief knows that Thomas is up to something and stops the ceremony. But a declaration must be honored. We find out through this that everyone belongs to a religion called Ancestor Science, where they believe that if they get back the tech that humanity had before the invasion, they could beat the monsters back, take our planet back. But Thomas the Trap Smasher has turned to the forbidden religion of alien science, where they thought they could steal monster tech and use it against them. And according to Thomas, both of Eric's now-deceased parents were alien sciencers also, getting him to go along with the plan. Eric leaves with his band to the edge of monster territory, where Thomas tells Eric where to find the monster tech. The door to monster territory. Thomas the Trap Smasher waited for a moment, listening. When his experienced ears had detected no unusual noises in the neighborhood, no hint of danger on the other side, he cupped his hands around his mouth, faced back the way he had come, and softly gave the oilating recognition call of the band. The four other warriors and the apprentice came up swiftly and grouped themselves about him. Then, at a signal from their leader, all squatted near the door. They ate first, rapidly and silently, removing their knapsack handfuls of food that the women had prepared for them and stuffing their mouths full. The beams from the glow lamps above their eyes darted incessantly, back and forth along the arched empty corridor. This was the place of ultimate, awful danger. This was the place where anything might happen. Eric ate most sparingly of all, as was correct for an initiate about to emerge upon his theft. He knew he had to keep his springiness of body and watchfulness of mind at their highest possible pitch. He saw his uncle nodding approvingly as he returned the bulk of his food to the knapsack. The floor vibrated slightly underfoot. There was a regular, rhythmic gurgling. Eric knew that meant they were in a holy place, directly over a length of monster plumbing. Two immense pipelines ran here, side by side. One was the sewer pipe to which mankind dragged their accumulations of garbage and in which they ceremoniously buried their dead. The other was a prime source of the fresh water without which life came to an end. Upon his return before the band started homeward, Thomas the Trap Smasher would make an opening in the plumbing and they would refill their canteens. The water here, close to monster territory, was always the sweetest and best. Now his uncle got to his feet and called Roy the Runner to him. While the other warriors watched, tense and still, the two men walked to the curved line and laid their spears against it. Satisfied, finally, they inserted spear points into the door's outline on either side and carefully pried the slab back towards them. They laid it on the floor of the corridor, very gently. A shimmering blur of pure whiteness appeared where the door had been. Monster territory. The strange, alien light of monster territory. Eric had seen many warriors disappear into it to fulfill their manhood tasks. Now it was his turn. Holding his heavy spear at the ready, Eric's uncle leaned forward into the whiteness. His body twisted as he looked up, down, around, on both sides. He withdrew and came back into the burrow. No new traps. He said in a soft voice. The one I dismantled last expedition is still up there on the wall. It hasn't been repaired. Now, Eric, here you go, boy. Eric rose and walked with him to the doorway, remembering to keep his eyes on the floor. You can't look up, he had been told again and again. Not right away. Not the first time you're in monster territory. If you do, you freeze. You're lost. You're done for completely. 
His uncle checked him carefully and fondly, making certain that his new loin straps were tight and that his knapsack and back sling were both in the right position on his shoulders. He took a heavy spear from Eric's right hand and replaced it with a light one from his back sling. If you're seen by a monster, he whispered, the heavy spear is not worth a damn. You scuttle to the closest hiding place and throw that light spear as far as you can. There's a chance that monster can't distinguish between you and the spear. It might follow the spear. Eric nodded mechanically, although this too had been told many times. This too was a lesson he knew by heart. His mouth was so dry, he wished it weren't unmanly to beg for water at such a moment. Thomas the Trap Smasher took his torch from him and slipped a glow lamp about his forehead. Then he pushed him through the doorway. Go make your theft, Eric, he whispered. Come back a man. Okay, here's your final warning before we start to get to the twists. Either leave and go buy your own copy of the book, or be prepared for all the secrets that are to be revealed. <laughs> this is an out-of-print book, so I'm telling the whole story since most of you will never read the book anyway, I'm guessing. So here we go. When Eric arrives at the spot, there are other people there. Strangers that Eric had never seen before. It is here that we find out that mankind is just the name of Eric's tribe, one of the most backwards people still existing, the last step above the wild men who had no language and had reverted to a more monkey-like body type. There are actually many tribes and groups of people still alive, all with varying levels of civilization, correlating to their distance from monster territory. Eric even hears rumors of a group of people that are far more advanced than the rest, the Aaron tribe. While meeting with the people, Eric encounters his first monster. Far off in the dazzling distance, he caught sight of the tremendously long gray body he had heard about since childhood, higher than a hundred men standing on each other's shoulders, the thick gray legs, each wider than two hefty men standing chest to chest. He caught just one wide-eyed, fear-soluble glimpse of the thing before he went into complete panic. His panic was redeemed by a single inhibition. He didn't spring forward and run away from the wall, but that was only because it would have meant running directly towards the monster. For one thoroughly insane moment, however, he thought of trying to claw his way through the wall against which his shoulders were pressed. The men he met with gave him the monster tech he would need to fulfill his steel and become a man. A blob of strange red goo. Confused, he took it back to where he had left the rest of his band at the edge of monster territory. But before he got all the way back, the monster returned, so he ran as fast as he could to the entrance. But when he got to the hole in the wall, it was sealed up. The stone used to conceal the hole from the monsters was put back in its place, locking him out in monster territory. Luckily, he was able to just barely shove it out of the way and get through. But why had they done this to him? Where had they gone? The tunnel on the other side of the stone was empty, but there was signs of a struggle. Eric made his way back to mankind, but when he got home, he was immediately taken prisoner by his own people. It seemed that Thomas the Trap Smasher wasn't the only one making deals with other tribes. The chief had also contacted other tribes after learning about the alien science alliance Thomas was involved in. The people that Eric had just met. The chiefs of the various tribes felt their power threatened by the alien science group, so they all banded together to wipe them out. And Eric stupidly, or at least not knowing any better, ran right into their arms. Eric is imprisoned with his dying uncle, who reveals to him that the chief had good reason to worry. Thomas was planning on taking over the tribe. He didn't care at all about alien science. He cared about power. He also reveals to Eric that Eric is the grandson of an Aaron tribe woman. Eric uses the red goo on his guard. He takes a small chunk as he was instructed, spits on it, and tacks it right to the forehead of his guard. But nothing happens. The guard's head is blown completely off, just from a tiny speck of the red goo when it was exposed to water. Eric escapes and tries to bring his uncle with him, but he dies in the process from his previous wounds. Eric is all alone now, and an outcast from his tribe. So he goes to the only place he can. He goes back to the strangers. But they are doing no better. The other tribes had all attacked them, just as Eric's tribe had attacked his uncle. Many are wounded. Many are dying. The ones that can still move decide that they need to go deep into monster territory to find a weapon that will allow them to defend themselves, or maybe even take over. Eric goes with them. 
On the journey, Eric is almost killed by a monster, but one of the more experienced members, Walter the Weapon Smasher, runs at the monster screaming and waving his arms, and the monster shrieks and runs away. Eric's mind is blown. How did that work? Walter tells him that there are two kinds of monsters, and you can tell them apart by the tentacles on their necks. One kind will kill you on sight. The other will run away from you. Eric had been lucky, and this kind would run. It had just not seen Eric before it almost stepped on him. When it saw Walter, however, it ran. They continue on to their destination, a trove of possible weapons that Walter the Weapon Seeker had once seen. When they finally arrive at their destination, they find a room with giant rods running up so high that you couldn't clearly see their tops, but they look to be supporting dazzling clear cubes at their tips. He went through the archway to the burrow that was the goal of the expedition. Walter, some 30 paces behind him. When he saw the succession of tall black rods standing on the floor, crisscrossed horizontally with dozens of other rods, he waved to the weapon seeker, who passed the wave on to the men at his rear. Then, the chunky chief scout pointed forward, giving Eric the order to move on. Now came the hard part, the truly frightening part. At least, there were no monsters about, none that he could see. Eric swallowed. He left the archway and the wall. He crept out into the open monster territory, where there was nothing but the harsh white light and stretching vistas of the floor. His heart began pounding. He found that his regular cautious breathing was turning into noisy gasps. He felt exposed, terrifyingly vulnerable, completely alone, and lost. He felt as if he would be lost in that whiteness forever. What was he doing here? He belonged back there, cowering against the blessedly safe wall. But he put his head down and continued to creep forward. Another step, and another. Now he had to force himself to slow. He'd been about to burst into a mad dash at nowhere. Easy, another step, and don't look up. Just as when you first came into monster territory, days ago as an initiate warrior. Another step without looking up, without going wild with panic. How far away was that rod-supported piece of monster furniture? Did this floor go on forever? Another step. A great frightening gasp. Another step. And another. He had arrived. His shoulder touched a rod. He flung his arms around it and hauled his mind back to calmness. He had arrived. He was near cover again, and at last he could look up. Still no monsters that he could see anywhere in the place. He held onto the rod with the crook of his elbow and signaled to Walter at the archway. Walter passed the signal on, shuddered, and then left the wall himself. Eric watched him sympathetically for a moment, then turned back to examine the thing he was standing under. It was composed of these black rods, each as thick as his arm, and each rising perpendicularly from the floor, straight into the dizzying heights above. Every fifteen or so paces, another rod reared into the air, and at intervals, each many times the height of a man, there were the rods running across at right angles to the others. Here and there, high among the rods, where a horizontal crossed a vertical, there was a small, semi-transparent cube at the junction point. The light was sharply reflected from these cubes, making it difficult to look at them steadily, but some of them had strange shadows flickering inside them. Did the shadows have anything to do with a weapon they might be able to use? Eric found it was impossible to stare upward very long. He looked back at Walter to see how the chief scout was progressing. Not well. The man's face was almost purple with the overseasoned mixture of effort and fear. His feet were beginning to splay. His knees were folding forward and down. He wouldn't make it. Taking a deep breath, Eric flung himself away from the relative safety of the rods and leapt across the floor. By the time he reached Walter, the man had almost collapsed. He grabbed Eric's arm with both hands. His eyes were tightly shut by now and would have pulled him down if fright had not so thoroughly loosened his muscles. The wall, he babbled. Give it up. Let's go back to the wall. Easy, Eric said. Easy, Walter. We're almost there. He guided the weapon seeker the last few paces to the rods. Walter held on to the upright post as desperately as Eric had and fought for breath. It was no simple thing for a human being to leave the wall in monster territory. Fortunately, there were plenty of upright rods in this structure. They weren't thick, but they were solid, 
it would give the feeling of cover, and at least the semblance of cover to all the men in the expedition. But he and Walter would have to distribute them down the rows of rods. No point in having too many men grouped around any one post. And they were dealing with panic-stricken lunatics who would tend to hang on as if for life itself to the first solid thing they encountered. Roy came across next. He had a hard time, but he didn't do nearly as badly as Walter. It was obvious that the younger the man, the more resilient he was psychologically, and more capable of taking the shattering experience of negotiating open monster territory. They guided Roy to a rod. He wound himself around it for a dozen tortured breaths before coming to and taking a look up, down, forward, backward. The rest of the expedition came over in groups of three. They had their hands full with men who slumped to the floor and wound themselves up in tight little balls of refusal, with men whose eyes suddenly rolled up in their heads and who wandered jerkily off in this direction or in that, with men who started to run away and who would bite and kick and gouge when they were caught, but fully half of the men made it across by themselves. When they had been distributed, one or two men to each upright post climbing above their heads into emptiness, Eric, Roy, and Walter discussed the next move with Arthur. I think we'll stay here for a while and take a break for a meal, the organizer decided. Do you agree? I think we should. We'll wait till everybody calms down and comes back to normal. Meanwhile, do you three feel like going on ahead and taking a look at what we've got coming up? How many more open spaces? You know, problems we might be facing. Anything that looks like a weapon. Whatever strikes you is a good idea. Eric and Roy followed Walter to the last row of standing rods. They shaded their eyes and stared across a long, empty stretch of floor to where there was another rod-like structure, very much like the one they were in. What do you think those shiny cubes are? Eric asked, pointing. Here and there, high in the other structure, were semi-transparent boxes just like the ones above them. A few contained liquid shadows. I don't know, Walter admitted, but I intend to find out. They're what I noticed when I passed this way before. They look as if they might be useful. Only, how will we get up to them? Think a spry man might climb one of those rods? Eric and Roy considered the height and lack of handholds. They both shook their heads. The weapon seeker nodded ruefully. Then there's only one thing to do. We go on until we find a structure low enough to climb. Monster furniture comes in all kinds of different sizes. We'll find a low one with some shiny boxes close to the floor. And we'll find other stuff too. In this place, I have a real strong feeling. Hold it! Eric grabbed his arm. Listen, do you hear that? The short, heavy man listened anxiously for a moment, then shook his head. Not a thing. What do you hear? But Roy had also tensed at Eric's warning and leaned forward alertly. Something's coming this way. It's not much of a sound yet, mostly vibration. You can feel it with your feet. The weapon seeker listened again. This time he nodded rapidly. Monsters, and more than one. He whirled to face the expedition, strung out at the bases of the rods behind them. Pointing his forefinger straight up in the air, he rotated one hand rapidly over his head. This, the most fearful alarm of all to any band, had to be given silently. It meant, monsters are upon us, up there, look out. No reaction from the others, and the three of them groaned to themselves. The members of the expedition were stuffing food into their mouths, taking swallows out of canteens, chatting together in low, friendly voices. No one was bothering to watch the scouts. What a bunch, Eric raged hopelessly. Baby warriors, his Uncle Thomas the Trap Smasher would have called them. The rumbling noises were getting louder. Walter made up his mind to dispense with expedition security precautions. You damn fools, he yelled. Monsters, don't you hear them? That got a reaction. Every man leapt to his feet. Knapsacks and canteens rolling away, white faces turned rapidly in their direction, looked off to examine the brilliantly lit spaces above. Eric slapped the back of the two scouts on either side of him. Let's get out of here, he said urgently. This was traditionally an every man for himself situation among the people of the burrows. He pointed across the floor to the other rod-like structures. There, they'll be after the bulk of the men at this one, let's go. Without waiting for a reply, he darted out into the open. From the corners of his eyes, he was conscious as he ran of huge gray monsters materializing out of the whiteness on all sides. Those things could move fast when they wanted to, and in relative silence too. The floor was vibrating no more than it had this morning when the creature watching them had walked away. He ran fast, forcing every bit of speed out of his legs. 
not at all aware now of the openness of the space he was on. The only thought in his mind concerned the monsters all about him. Would he be stepped on? When? Would he feel it when it happened? Or would it be over too fast? A moment before he reached the other set of rods, somebody passed him and left into hiding among the posts of the structure. Roy the runner, starting late, had the legs to make up for lost time. Then Eric was there too, cowering behind a rod. He watched Walter the weapon seeker stumble the last couple of paces and fall gasping two rods away from him. But the rest of the expedition was in trouble. The men scrambled about, mindlessly shrieking inside the rod structure they had quit. Five monsters now stood around it in silence, making any escape to the outside almost impossible. The monsters had known where the expedition lay hidden. They had made directly for it. And they were doing something in an organized fashion. What? Eric strained his eyes to see, but the movements of the gray bodies were unfamiliar and unclear. Suddenly, from each one of them, a long green rope dropped to the floor. The rope seemed almost alive. As they lay on the floor, they quivered and bits of darker color slid up and down their coils. There was a click from one of the monsters, then a long, scraping musical note. The ropes began acting even more like living things. They slid into the rod-like structures and among the upright posts. Wherever they touched a man, they turned completely dark, and he was carried along with them, apparently stuck to the surface. All together now, Eric heard Arthur the organizer yelling. Stay together and work on those ropes. All we have to do is get each man free. Then a rope touched him in passing, and he became just another shrieking attachment, alternatively tugging and pushing at it. In a few brief moments, every man in the other structure was a madly wriggling prisoner. They seem to want us alive, Walter whispered to Eric. And do you notice how these monsters move around? They're a lot more deliberate than any I've ever seen before. With their cluster of screaming, arm-waving humanity, the green ropes were picked up one at a time by the monsters. Eric saw that the long necks came down and the pink tentacles near the head did the grasping. The tentacles, then, were the equivalent of hands or fingers. There goes the entire expedition, Roy called out hysterically. What do we do now? What the hell do we do now? Walter shot an angry scowl in his direction. Keep your voice down, you damn fool. If you lose control of yourself, we're all three dead. As if in corroboration, a long neck twisted down out of the whiteness above, and a monster's head swung to and fro inquiringly outside the rod-like structure in which they were hiding. It was only a man's height above the floor, and Eric, nauseated with fear, felt that the eyes, in each of which a narrow, purple iris swam, were staring directly at him, and that pointed, stinking mouth. At least three men could disappear into it without creating a noticeable bulge. He forced himself to stand absolutely still, although every muscle in his body yearned to leap off and make a run for it. Those pink tentacles, this close. For the first time, he saw how incredibly long they were. They could probably grab him up with ease. But the monster, though staring directly in his direction, did not seem to see him. The head poked around among the rods and a corner of it touched Roy where he stood rigidly a short distance away. The runner threw his hands up, screamed, and ran. Instantly, the head was pulled up out of sight. Roy flung himself to the other end of the structure. Now we're in for it, said Walter, the weapon seeker grimly. The two of them saw a rope drop among the rods near Roy. It slid towards him smoothly, caught him, and kept going. It was going for them. We scatter, the weapon seeker ordered. Good luck, kid. They leapt apart in opposite directions. Eric bent over, trying to keep his body low for minimum visibility, and sped in a zigzag course among the rods. If he could get to the other side, there might be another structure nearby. He heard Walter yell, and he spent a precious moment on a look. The weapon seeker was now caught on the green rope only a few paces from the struggling runner, and the rope was sliding swiftly at Eric, pulling both men along with it. Eric straightened. Visibility was unimportant now. He might as well be running as fast as he could. He heard the yells of Walter and Roy coming closer and closer behind him. He could not run any faster. He just could not run any faster. Swift, terrible, cold touched his side and he was pulled off his feet. He found himself screaming. He hammered at the green rope, dark black where it was attached to his hip. It was like a part of him. It couldn't be pulled off. He screamed and screamed and screamed. A monster head came down and one of the pink tentacles grasped an end of the rope. Up they went, the three of them, screaming, flailing their arms and legs, 
beating against the rope with their fists. Up they went, higher and higher, into the dizzying whiteness. Up, up, up they went, to where the floor was no longer visible, to where the monsters could examine them, the monsters whose prisoners they were. That was when they got to find out what the cubes were for. As the monsters lifted the screaming men high into the air, the cubes came into focus. They were clear cages full of other humans. They were all dropped into one, with another man already in there, a man from the Aran tribe. He says that they are in a pest control building. Mankind, and all the other tribes Eric had ever met, all lived in the walls of an alien version of the Orkin Man office, where they tested out new traps and ways to kill pests. E.g., they specialized in killing humans. As Eric is stuck in the cage, several other members of his group are taken out by the monsters and dissected alive on a table within sight of the cage. Then they come, and they take Eric. It all happened so fast, so utterly without warning, that Eric had no time to think of running across the cage or struggling to evade capture. One startled yelp escaped him as he rose high into the air and saw the upturned faces of his companions recede into indistinguishable white dots. And then he was moving through the vastness, dangling from the end of the monster's rope. There was a cold streak making a diagonal across his back where the rope had welded itself to his flesh. But worse was the cold dampness in his mind, the liquid terror that was congealing into the certainty of imminent and very painful death. Dissection? No. According to Jonathan Danielson, the monsters were satisfied with a single sample from each group more likely another trap to be tried out. Something as ugly as the one he'd just seen chew up a man. A laboratory where they test all kinds of homicides, sprays, traps, poisoned lures, everything. Eric heard Jonathan's words echo in his head. Which of these was he to experience? In what monster tests was he to scream out the last tortured shreds of life? In one respect, he was fortunate. He knew roughly what to expect. He would be no docile laboratory animal, that at least. He would fight, as long as he could, in any way that he could. His hand moved to the back sling for a spear, then stopped. No, don't waste a spear until there was a chance of a good cast. Wait until he was set down and was close to a vital organ, an eye, say, or a mouth open enough to expose the inside of the throat. A badly thrown spear now would only alert the monster to his murderous determination. Not that he had too much hope in human weapons. He'd already seen spears bounce harmlessly off that thick gray hide. What he needed now was one of the unusual implements of warfare that a man like Walter the Weapon Seeker might come up with. That soft red stuff the chunky man had given him on their first meeting. It had blown the head off of Stephen the Strong-Armed. He still had some of that left. His first theft. Eric had intended to keep evidence of it until his dying day, but from the appearance of things, that day had moved into the immediate present. A weapon Walter had stolen from the monsters, to be used now against them. He reached behind him, felt around in the knapsack until he located the stuff. How much should he tear off? A very little bit had done for Stephen quite spectacularly, but the monster? Look at the size of the creature. Better use all of it, and make it count. As he spun from the rope's end, facing first one way, then another, in the soaring white space, Eric weighed the irregular red ball in his right hand and waited for an opportunity. It was going to be complicated. He had to spit on the stuff before he threw it, and once it was moistened, he had to get rid of it immediately. That meant he had to figure out his opening exactly right. If the spin were turning him away from the monster once he spat on the red ball, he'd have to get rid of it anyway. He'd have to throw his only real weapon away into emptiness and waste it. Obviously, then, as he began to face the monster, a moment before it was in full range, that was the time to go into action. Eric began paying careful attention to the duration of each spin, absorbing the rhythm with his mind. There was no fear in him now. Instead, there was the beginning of an exaltation that almost burst from his lips in a song. If he were successful, he knew, it would be the end of him. Once the explosion occurred, once the monster was killed, he, Eric, would fall, with or without the rope. 
an enormous distance to the floor. He would be dashed to pieces upon it, but the life of his captor would have been extinguished first. At last a man would have done what so many men had dreamed of for so long, hit back at the monsters. The members of his own expedition would see it. Roy, Walter the Weapon Seeker, Arthur the Organizer, they would see it and cheer themselves hoarse, hit back at the monsters, hit back at them, not as a nibbling annoyance, as a thief of food or artifacts, but as a full and deadly antagonist, hit back at the monsters, and with their own weapon. He hoped the expedition could still see him. The monster had passed the circular table used for dissection and testing and was going on. Where? It didn't matter. Nor was it important if he were out of sight of his caged friends. Only one thing counted. Get the rhythm of the spin right. Make a throw at the exact correct moment. And take a monster with him into the sewers. What a trophy to exhibit before his ancestors. Eric was positive he had the timing now. He allowed himself one more spin, however, and went through the whole process in his mind. Here I spit. Here I throw. Here it hits. Just as I begin to turn. Here the explosion. And here, as my back is towards him, the monster begins to topple. Yes, he had the rhythm. He started turning towards the monster again and held the soft mass near his mouth, working up saliva. He began to see the creature out of the corner of his eye. Now! Slowly, carefully, he spat on the ball, turning it round and round in his hand. The arm went back and waited while a portion of his mind beat out the pulsations it had learned. Then, when the monster was almost in front of him, he threw. He threw in a high arc, aiming for the creature's head, which quivered to and fro at the end of that impossibly long neck. It would hit. Holy ancestors, he had thrown right. But as he began to turn away, Eric saw that something had gone wrong. The monster had noticed the red ball, and its head had moved down to meet it. Mouth opened avidly. The monster was swallowing it. It was swallowing the weapon. The last thing Eric saw on that turn was a ripple that went down the length of the great throat, and in the ugly purple eyes, unmistakable enjoyment. Then the spin had turned his back to the monster. He waited despairingly for the sound of an explosion, a cataclysm that would tear the immense creature apart from the inside. He didn't hear it. There was a sound at last behind him, not at all an explosion, but loud and odd nonetheless. Eric allowed himself to hope again. The rope from which he hung jerked back and forth. He twisted his head and strained his eyes as the spin back began. Where was it? There. Yes, there it was. He could see the whole monster again. And his whole body went limp with defeat. Ripples continued to run down that long stretch of throat, smaller and smaller ripples as the effect, whatever it was, evidently began wearing off. Whenever a ripple came down to the point where the neck joined the body, there was a repetition of the loud, odd sound Eric had heard when his back was to the monster. Now, facing it and seeing the entire creature, Eric could almost recognize the sound. Not quite a sneeze, a little more than a cough, and more than reminiscent of a human moan of pleasure with the same enjoyment-filled upbeat at the end. Yes, the effect was definitely wearing off. The odd sounds came at longer and longer intervals. They were less and less loud. At the end of the curving neck, the triangular head probed about restlessly in great arcs, searching with what seemed to be delighted hunger for more red balls. The monster's eyes were alight with ecstasy. Apparently, it did not in any way connect its tiny human captive with the pleasures it had experienced. That was just as well, Eric decided, hanging from the green rope where it adhered to his back. There was enough of a humiliation involved in having the knowledge all to himself. Eric the monster toppler. Eric the alien killer. That's how he had seen himself in those few fierce moments of anticipation. How about Eric the monster tickler? He asked himself bitterly. That's a good name. What had gone wrong with the weapon? Well, to begin with, he realized, it probably had not been a weapon in the first place. Walter the Weapon Seeker had stolen it from the monsters and found he could use it as one. Against humans. You added your saliva, threw it against a man, and he exploded. But among the monsters, it could have been something totally different. A food. A condiment of some sort. A drug. Perhaps even an aphrodisiac. Or conceivably, 
part of some complex game that they played. Mixed with human saliva, its properties had no doubtably been altered, but not in the direction of any danger to the monster. Eric's carefully mounted attack had given the alien no more discomfort than a concentrated, highly individualized orgy. But instead of testing out a new pest control method, they drop him in a cage with a beautiful woman. She tries to kill him at first, but then when he talks, she realizes he is not a wild man and won't eat her. Apparently they're cannibals as well. She tells him the monsters don't see female humans often, since thefts are almost always done by men, so they decided to make her into a breeder for them. Eric was to be her suitor. Her name was Rachel Esther's daughter. Rachel informs him that she is also from the Aran tribe, and was on a mission to test a new tool they developed, along with the man from the other cage. This tool was something that could disable the monster's green grabby rope tools, a device that works on principles that our current technology doesn't understand. It seems the Aran people are more advanced than we are. Partially out of wanting to keep their captors happy, partially because why not, they mate and eventually she becomes pregnant. But then the realization of what the monsters will do to their kid is forced to the forefront of their minds. Their baby, or babies, will be test subjects. And suddenly Eric is obsessed with figuring out an escape plan. The monsters were also apparently a bit impatient with Eric, however, and dropped in another suitor for Rachel, who luckily turned out to be the last living member of Eric's original band, Ron the Runner. Eric now has more help for his escape. Eventually, he comes up with an insane plan, but it just might work. They're going to play dead and get flushed down the toilet. <laughs> it actually does work, but they almost die in the process several times. Drowning, hypothermia, fast-flowing water, but by the skin of their teeth, they just make it out alive. But now they are in a strange area. They don't even know where they are. They know that they are still in the same monster building, but these walls were dozens of miles long and just as high. There could be a hundred hostile tribes between them and their destination with the Aran tribe. On the way, they come across some tribes that have been exterminated by a new chemical the monsters have come up with. But luckily, no hostile living tribes. Once they reach the Aran people, Rachel introduces Eric and Ron to the tribe, and the tribe leader finally lets them in on the plan to defeat the monsters. They won't. They're going to board a monster spaceship and use it to travel to a different planet. Eric, hearing this, is understandably furious. They are running away? But the Aaron explains it to Eric that there are actually more humans alive at that moment than at any point previous to the invasion. The monsters provided massive amounts of temperate living space with easy access to food. Every wall of a monster house was more living space than the tallest of skyscrapers, and they were all kept at a comfortable temperature. Most tribes didn't even wear clothing, at least no more than a loincloth. So they all board a monster spaceship and break up into well over a dozen groups. Each group is to get their own monster planet to populate. The end. Wait, what? What? <laughs> if you're like me, right now you're probably asking yourself, wait, what? what? That, that is the ending? But the monsters, they never killed the monsters! Yes, that's correct. That's what I meant when I said earlier that people feel ripped off by the ending. In any other alien novel, with invading aliens, we kill them all and take our planet back. But in Of Men and Monsters, we do no such thing, despite being teased with the proposition the entire book. Eric and the others are all constantly talking about how to kill the monsters and take back Earth. But in the end, we don't. We can't. They're just too big and tough, too advanced and too strange. Eric uses that red goo on the monster at one point, and it eats it and enjoys it. But the monsters did not kill humanity as you are led to believe in the beginning of the book. They have actually helped us in many ways. As far as evolution is concerned, the golden age of humanity came after the invasion. The Aaron explains to Eric that humanity is the best pest to ever exist. Once the monsters landed, humans outcompeted rats in a matter of weeks. Rat populations went from the billions on Earth to almost extinct overnight once humans went from feeding rats to feeding on rats. Once we became their competition, they had no chance. Rats, the greatest, most prolific pest to ever annoy mankind, and they were nothing compared to us. Once we became the pests, our population numbers exploded to the point that almost every square inch of the Earth was covered with humans. 
Wherever there were monsters, there were millions of humans feeding off of their food stores and living in their walls, enjoying their temperate climates. So the Aaron's plan was not to run, but to take over every single planet the monsters occupied. They had very similar needs to humans, so wherever they could live, humans would thrive. Humanity will dominate the galaxy as the accidentally imported pests of the monsters. Now let's talk about some of the problems I have with this book. There are actually pretty few considering that this book is a spoof more than it is serious. The ideas behind it are pretty solid, but IRL, I think the groups at the end were a little too small to flourish and they would all eventually die of inbreeding and lack of genetic variation. They already mentioned that this is happening with the Aaron people before they leave the planet. By far the biggest thing I have a problem with, though, are the aliens themselves. They're just too big for any known organics to support. What were they made of? They seem to have similar nutritional requirements as us, so they should be made of known compounds. As an aside, I did want to point out the red exploding goo scene, though. Something as big as the monsters would require amazing amounts of energy just to stay alive. The red goo obviously was very energy dense, as it can explode. So I wonder if the monsters ate the red goo. Was that a hint on how they got as big as they did? Maybe the only reason they would grow that big at all was because they had access to this extremely energy dense food? Hence why it was so excited to get some? Well, that's just a thought but I can let their size go as a literary device to turn humans into the equivalent of mice. As we also see when Walter the Weapon Seeker runs at one of the monsters and it jumps, screams, and runs away. Apparently the two different types of monsters are supposed to represent the two different genders. Although I've seen plenty of men run away from mice also. <laughs> but this book plays on your stereotypes and expectations. That's why, in my opinion, it's a great work of sci-fi. I absolutely love the books with fun twists and tricks like this. They keep you on your toes and keep the story fresh and interesting. If every book was just a variation on the same theme like so many movies are, then they would not have kept my attention for this long. So while the characters may be a little underdeveloped, they are just a vehicle for the punchline at the end. And the book is not that long at 250 pages, so it's a quick read. Definitely worth the time if you ask me. Well, if you're still here, thanks for staying this long. If you like that at all, please like, comment, and most importantly, subscribe. It's free and only takes you a little click. So I hope to see you back here for the next one. Take care.